thank you for being here. I've hit that age in life where glasses are on and off, so I apologize if I'm doing that this morning. Um, if you will, uh, just rise and uh, greet one another this morning. chatty bunch this morning. It's good. Um, I have just a few announcements. So if you have some of your own, come on up. Um, I, uh, who got up the earliest this morning? Who got up at 5 a.m.? Any 5 a.m.? 6 a.m.? 6 a.m.? 5 a.m.? 6 a.m.? Anybody earlier than 6? Who is the latest to get up? 8.20, right here. 8.20, 8.20. That was not my plan. I, I thought I, last night, I said something to Jeanette. Uh, I want to be there by 8.30. She came in at 8.20. So you're up yet, it's 8.20. I don't remember my alarm going off. I, so, made it here. Shower, I didn't have coffee, I didn't have breakfast. I did have a shower and I brushed my teeth, so it's something. So I'm still like settling in, so just give me a minute. So um, this morning at 10.15, we do have coffee time, coffee kitchen downstairs uh, right below us here in the fellowship hall. Um, there may be donuts as well. Um, Sunday school hour at uh, 10.30, and then after Sunday school, um, there will be projection training um, upstairs on the projector with Phil. Um, this week, Tuesday, board reports are due. Um, and then Wednesday is the deadline to get your submissions in for the newsletter. Um, and Wednesday evening, we do have youth at 6 o'clock. And I don't think we have any other announcements. Um, we'll continue worshiping as we listen to the prelude. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa and Mira. Uh, would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful week you've given us. Um, just may we make today a day of gratitude, um, a day to be challenged, um, time to be challenged this morning, Lord, um, but more importantly, to lift you up. Um, just help us not focus on ourselves, but focus on you. Um, and just let, may this service be a blessing to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you would, please stand. Um, we have a few hymns.
If you're using your hymnal, turn to 31, to God be the glory. If you turn to 519, great is thy faithfulness, and then after that we'll sing It Is Well With My Soul on 524.
Dave Carell has the children's story this morning. So kids, come on up, and Dave will lead us in the story. Can you hear me? Good. I figured out you guys got a pretty good gig here. I noticed you get snacks every day. All right. I'm going to get you in on some of that. Who's doing children's chapter? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, what can we talk about? Uh, hey, let me ask you a question. Did you ever see something? really, really wanted, and it tempts you to take it when you know you probably shouldn't, right? Yeah. What's up, Colton? Uh, um, Did you ever see anything that you really wanted that wasn't yours or something? Yeah. Try to sneak <laughs> Well, it happened to me. I can tell you a story. Okay. When I was, oh, probably your age. I was at the grocery store with my mom. You guys ever hear of bazooka bubble gum? Probably too young for that, right? You've heard of it? Yeah? One little bitty piece of bubble gum wrapped around, it was a comic, right? Funny comic. Uh, get past the comic, grab the bubble gum, and then read the comic, right? Well, I was at the store with my mom when I was really young, and I saw that. Um, it was not where it was supposed to be. It was sitting with all the bread. So I thought, I told myself, you know, if, if it's not where it's supposed to be, if it's with the bread, it's fair game. I can go ahead and take it, right? No problem with it. So that's what I did. Only when I got home did I open it up and, you know, in front of my mom and, and eat the piece of bubble gum and, and all was good. No. I stuck it in my shoe so nobody could find it. Well, I went to take my bath like we did every night. And my mom, once a week, Sunday night, this happened when we were, some of us will remember this, what did mom do every Sunday night? She got my shoes and my other shoes, and she started polishing up the Buster Browns. Okay? Well, guess what she found? The bubble. Oh, I was in trouble. I was in trouble. So I got out of my bath, and she was standing there with the bubble gum. Didn't even have to say anything. I knew I was in trouble. Where did you get this? I explained my story to her. Hey, it was in the bread aisle. It's fair game. Uh, she didn't buy it. And you know what she told me? She said, you know it wasn't right as well because you tried to hide it rather than just chewing it and keeping it out in the open, right? So I knew, but my eyes deceived me, right? They tempted me. So we have to be careful with that. Right? I knew it was wrong. I came up with every reason why it was all for me to take that gum, but I knew in my heart that it was wrong. Right? So, any idea what happened? I got dressed, put on my nice, clean, polished shoes, and we went back to the grocery store. And I stood there with that gum, trembling, Walked up to the manager and had to explain what I did and how I knew that it was wrong and that I would never do that again and apologize to him. He was a good manager. Did he give me the gum back and say, it's okay, you have this? No. No. I got a scolding from him. He took the gum away. He told me I couldn't buy any gum, even buy any gum from him, for the next week. 
which killed a seven-year-old boy. Because that's what we lived for. Okay? So we have to be careful, right, with, with what, what our eyes see and the thoughts that it gives us, right, the temptations that it gives us, and we have to, we have to go, uh, we have to go there. So understand that. Do you believe that your eyes deceive you? Would you like me to prove? Come around here. Come closer. Okay? Do you see these? If, if we look at this, which one is bigger, the blue or the red? The red's bigger? Everybody agree on that? Is the red bigger? Yeah? You don't know, can you? I'm old. When we get old, our eyesight goes, so I need some help sometimes. So you're, you're sure the red is bigger, right? Okay. If I do this, which is bigger? Blue? Blue? You just told me it was red. So what if I told you that if you put them together, they're the exact same size? So you think our eyes can deceive us at times and lead us down the wrong path, right? Yeah, so be careful, right? And just like me, you, you pretty much know when you're something that's giving shouldn't be having, right? Right, so we gotta, we gotta protect our hearts that way. One way we can do that is just turn towards, turn towards Jesus at that time, right? Jesus, am I, am I doing what you want me to do here? Am I making the right decision, All right? Gotta watch our eyes, okay? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to not only be with these children as they go through life in this fallen world and their eyes see things that they shouldn't see and uh, give us thoughts that we shouldn't be having and, and make us do, making us do things like stealing a piece of bubble gum. Lord, we know that's wrong. But our eyes can deceive us and we can make mistakes and do things that we shouldn't do. Lord, we ask that you be with these children throughout their lives as, as the temptations come with what they see. And Lord, we ask that you stay strong and steadfast with them. Pour into their hearts. Let them be able to make those decisions of right and wrong in this world that they're going into and already a part of. Be with them, Lord. Be with all of us. Protect all of our hearts from the things that our eyes see and the thoughts that that sight, that sight brings, and keep us steadfast and moving towards you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go get some snacks. I think that's the rule. All right. Um, we'll enter in a time of prayer this morning. I didn't say thank you and, and, and welcome to our guests this morning. I know we have a number of folks gone uh, with very related responsibilities and, and things this morning. I know my own family, we have some friends that are in the church service there, so they're there to support them. Um, but uh, thank you to the cheer section that's here this morning and um, welcome you. So if you'd each stand and we'll... No. Um, we won't do that to you, but um, we will enter a time of prayer this morning, um, and, and in part, I did want to say um, thanks and welcome to our guests. Um, if you would, please bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, um, we just thank you for who you are, we thank you for being all-knowing, uh, for having things in control that um, even when our lives feel um, just out of whack and spiraling at times, um, that you have us in your hand. You know how it ends, you know how it begins, um, and you know, you've created it all. So um, we just thank you for um, finding peace in that. Um, we just come to you this morning, Lord, um, enter a time of, of confession. Um, and I'll just give everyone just a moment. Um, for the things we've done, um, where we've fallen short, um, 
where we've made poor choices or maybe just you know, not acted all together. Um, so I'll give just a couple moments for each, each person to just silently lift those up. Come to, this, come to you this morning, Lord, to say thank you. We thank you for the, the friendships and the relationships that are represented here. Um, we thank you for the offerings that are given. We thank you for the beautiful weather you've given us the last several days, um, even the rains um, that we so badly needed. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. For the guests that have been able to join us, thank you for bringing them here safely. Um, pray that they feel welcome, and um, we just appreciate Sam being here to, to share your message as well. And as we just enter this time of, of worship and of, of getting into your word, Lord, um, we just ask you would open our hearts, soften our hearts, um, make us fertile, give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. And with that, we will invite, uh, actually it's Jonathan to give the scripture first, and then we'll invite Sam forward. to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Sam's got the lapel mic, so we'll move over to that. Um, I did want to welcome Sam this morning. I actually, this was not planned. Sam and I graduated uh, together, and so um, I knew I was, I don't know, two months ago scheduled for a worship leader, so I got the bullets and everything. I'm like, Sam? Like, it's the Sam Schultz, right? So, um, so that was really cool to see, and so I think he had a similar reaction, so it was nice to um, see that this morning. We look forward to your message. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah. yeah, my reaction was, is that the same Brandon Griffith that... We had good times, John, and it's like, a, it's like a class of 98 reunion this morning. Just dated myself. Hey, turn to, turn to 1 Samuel chapter, I don't remember even what chapter it was, 16. I'm glad to be here today. How about you? Very nice. I, uh, I think the last time I was here... I was marrying my brother. This is, if you're visiting today, it's not one of those churches. It's a little weird. Um, it's not that way. Uh, I performed the wedding for my brother Matt and his wife Becky. Um, I think it was about 18 years ago, maybe. So I think that was the last time I was here. But it's good to be back, and uh, it's good to be with you guys. Um, I, uh, I like movies. Does anybody else like movies? Have you, this, now this is going to date me too, have you seen, this is old, it's probably not a very decent movie, but I like movies of all kinds, especially ones that make me laugh. Have you seen Office Space? Some of the guys are like, oh yeah, it's funny. It's about a guy that doesn't like his job and just decides he's not going to go anymore and, and other things. The opening scene of the movie Office Space you can relate if you've done any traveling on a highway this summer. Anybody travel this summer? Two-lane, four-lane highway? Okay, you'll, you'll drive, you'll, you'll, you'll relate. The opening scene of, of Office Space is this guy that's it's in a hurry. He's late to work, and he's, um, 
in his car driving down the highway and there's a traffic jam. You guys remember this scene? And his, he's in the right side lane and the lane stops and he's sitting there. He's like, man, man, I got to get going. And the other lane is just, is just going, right? And so he changes lanes and then immediately that lane stops and his lane starts going. He's like, oh, man. So he, he switches lanes again and people are honking at him because he's switching lanes. And then his lane stops and the one he was in starts going again. And he's just getting madder and madder and madder and angrier. Have you been in that situation? You know what that's like, right? You're like, man, this, those guys are going. There must be an accident in my lane, so I'll switch. And then the moment you do, it always never fails. The moment you do, the other one. Sometimes it's just best to stay in your lane and let it play out, right? Not me. I try to, I still try to switch. Oh. I don't like, like, I'm driving a car. I'm on a road. It should be moving, right? We should not be parked. If I wanted to park, I'd be in a parking lot. So I get, I get flipped. But anyway, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And I'm kind of like Brent, uh, Brandon. Um, I have floaters really bad, and so I sometimes can't see. So I'm having a bad morning with those. So hopefully we can get through this and I can see everything. But 1 Samuel 16 to 13-ish says, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. When they met him, they said, do you come in peace? Samuel was an awesome dude, by the way. We'll get into that some other time. Do you come in peace? And Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Verse 6, when they arrived... Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Uh, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't look at things a man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse had Shema passed by, but Samuel said, no, uh, not as the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to them, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you got? <laughs> got any more? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's out tending the sheep. Samuel said, well, send for him. Well, we'll not sit down until he arrives. Anybody have that person in your family that's always late? And you're always waiting on that one person. David was that guy in this moment right there. They couldn't sit down until David had arrived. He was out in the field tending sheep. Uh, I just think it's funny he made his family wait. So he sent and had him brought in, and he was ruddy. It was fine appearance, handsome features. He had good hair. Then, then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And then Samuel went back home. David was anointed king when he was about, we think based on what we know about the time and the culture and, and, and what scholars have said, we think he was about roughly anywhere between 10 to 15 years old. Anybody in here 15 years old? Anybody close? King! But not yet. What would it be like to be anointed at, at 15 years old to know you're going to become the king, but not yet? 
Because there's already a king in, in, in place, right? Saul's already there. We already got our first king. He's already, he, you can't have two kings at one time. And so David's anointed king, and all of his family and all of Bethlehem that was afraid of Samuel, that knew that he was there to do something, knew that David was about to be king, but not yet. There's some tension when there's one that's capable and qualified and upcoming, and then there's another one in their seat. It's tough. So then later, David kills Goliath, and then he goes to work for Saul full time. Still not king. Let's turn to chapter 18. Look at verse 2. Chapter 18, verse 2. From that, doll, Saul, uh, from that doll, from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. He was working for the king now. So, so imagine this. Imagine this. I'm going to try to dodge the cameras, make them do their work this morning. Is it one of those that follows you? I don't know. David is anointed king. Hey. We're going to give you this promotion. We're going to make you this thing. You're going to get this job. You're going to become this person. You're going to be the greatest person in all of our country, and everybody's going to respect you and do whatever you say. But not yet. In fact, we're going to put you to work for the old guy who's crazy. We know about Saul, don't we? He's, he, he's got this, like, he's tormented. There's things in his head that are driving him crazy. And Saul happened, or Saul, David happened to play the guitar, almost as good as Brandon, but not quite. And, and David's job was to make the current king feel better. The current king was nuts. He tried to kill him multiple times. How would you like to have a boss like that? And yet David has this anointing, he has this event, and they, hey, they came out in the field, they got me, they were all waiting for me when I got there, I showed up, and then they said, you're going to be the next king of Israel. And they anointed me, and I am now the Lord's anointed, which gives me a special place in all of the Jewish community, I'm the, the Lord's anointed. You don't, it's hands off, the Lord's anointed. And now I got to go play guitar for the, the current king, like, like, not yet. Like, well, when's my time? We don't know yet. The current king's there, and he's going to be king as long as he's alive. And it's your job to make him happy. Good luck with that, because nobody else could. What is it to know your calling? What is it to know that you, your potential, to know your... your uh, job, your place in life, and have to wait on it? What's it like to be in a place where you know you're capable of doing something, but you just don't have that opportunity yet? What's it like when you feel that your boss or supervisor isn't doing a good job, and you can do it better, but you don't get that promotion, and it's not your place, and so therefore you have to sit by? How many people start businesses because they think they can do it better than their boss? Right? What's it like when you're stuck in a financial hole that you just can't get out of? You want to be faithful with your finances, but your circumstances just prevent you from doing so. What's it like when you feel like you just can't catch a break in life? You overcome that one obstacle and you start feeling like, okay, maybe I'll get out of this hole, only to have something else happen and put you right back in that place. Like, why? I, I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to be obedient. I'm trying to do everything that God wants me to do, and yet I just can't catch that break. What's that like? What's it like when you can't seem to get healthy? Like, it's just one, like, I just, I got this thing in my back, and then, then once I start feeling better there, then it's, then it's my shoulder, and then... Then when my shoulder starts feeling better and I start moving, then it's my knee starts getting, like, these are real things. I'm almost, we're almost 45, guys. Like, it's beginning. It's like, you get up in the morning, it's like, oh, this is going to be a long day, you know. Some of you know it. You're laughing at us, young ones that are entering that stage. 
what's it like when, when you've got this thing and you know that you should be past it, you have every desire to get past it and beyond it, and you try and you work at it and you do everything you can from every angle to get over, over this, this whatever it is. Just when you get there, something changes in your, your back. You're stuck again. It's like changing lanes, right? And then we have the scripture reading this morning. Um, uh, where did he go? What was his name? John. Jonathan. That he read for us. That was a really uplifting passage, wasn't it? No. Oh. Do you remember what he said? 2 Corinthians? Let's go back to that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Keep your finger in, in Samuel. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul even says this. He's got, I've got this thorn. I've got this nagging thing. This, <laughs> he calls it this gift from Satan. You know, this thing that, that is just driving me crazy. We think it might be blindness. Remember when he, we met Jesus along the way? And God blinded him. Saul, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Scholars think maybe it's because he just never recovered from being blind from meeting Jesus, so he's got this thing. He writes with big letters so he can see it, right? So he's got this thing. We don't know what it is. Maybe it's appendicitis. I don't know. It could be anything. But he's got this thorn, this nagging thing in his life that he just can't get rid of. And then he's wearing all this other hardship the people that he's, he's interacting with. And that's going to happen. You interact with people, they're going to they're gonna burn you. But he's still, he's still going. He's still saying, God, you know, I'm following you. And then he says, hey, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Gladly. So that Christ's power may rest on me. Ten, this is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses. You're crazy insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. He's delighting in them. What does he know that we don't know? Because when I face those things, I'm not necessarily delightful. Oh, Lord, thanks for the pain in my neck. He says, for when I'm weak, I'm strong. What does he know? Saul was so bad, he tried to kill David multiple times. Have you ever had a boss that has tried to kill you. I have not, thankfully. But have you had a boss that has made your life a wreck? Have you had somebody in your life that, is, that has felt like it's their personal agenda to make things difficult for you? You come up with creative ways to respond to them in your head, in your spare time, don't you? Like, if I could just... I'm looking up here at all this TP and this soap and this... Toilet paper, even some of the other stuff on there. I could really nail somebody's house with some of those supplies right there, and they would never know. It was me. Well, actually, I did get a reputation for doing that kind of thing. I haven't done it in a while. When I'm in a spot like this, Paul says, I'm strong? All right. We need to look at David. We need to ask, okay, God, how did he handle things? How did, how did that work? Before we get too far into Scripture, we're about half done. Let's take a moment and pray, and let's ask God for help, because this is a hard one, right? So we, we take a moment just to pray with me one more time. God, this morning we, we enter your classroom. There's nothing that we can learn on our own. It's your word and not ours. And so we enter your classroom to be taught by your Holy Spirit, to be touched by you, to be tickled by you in order that we might be transformed by you. It's you are the one that gives us the insight. As Brandon prayed earlier, God, do make us fertile ground to receive um, the words that you have for us. Give us insight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what did David do? How did he handle things? What, what, what was the trick? I'm a guy. I like to fix things. When there's a problem, how do I fix it? Right? I have a construction company. I can fix lots of things. It's really hard to fix people. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 18. David, David stayed in his lane. That's the, that's the big deal right there. 
and stayed in his lane. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? How do I do that? Chapter 18, verse 2 of 1 Samuel, it says that from the day Saul, that day Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. Verse 5, whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army, and that pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. David stayed in his lane. Whatever Saul sent him to do, the boss that was trying to kill him, the guy that was in his way for the promotion, the guy that was doing a bad job, and David thought, you know, I could probably maybe do this better. David did it so successfully that everybody caught on and go, wow, this guy's got his act together. We're not going to make him king yet because we got one. But we can promote him. We can respect him for who he is. Verse 14, chapter 18, verse 14. In everything David did, he had great success. Why? Because the Lord was with him. God, I serve you. Colossians 3.23, do everything as though you're serving the Lord, not people. Work at it with all you got, because it's God you serve, not people. So am I serving the king, or am I serving our Savior? Am I serving my boss that's causing me problems, or am I doing an even better job because I'm serving the king, the one who died for me? It's kind of a leapfrog. Yeah, I'll do what you tell me to do, but I'm going to do it so well I want to honor, honor my Savior in the way that I do it. I'm going to stay in my lane so well that everything I do is successful in that space, right there in that moment. I've got control of this. I'm in this lane. I'm doing these things. I'm in this role. I have this responsibility. I have these influences. I can do these things. I, can, I am this person. I have these abilities and talents. I have these spiritual gifts. I have all of these things in this in this this treasure can that I have in my toolbox that I can use, and, and these are the things I'm going to be really, really good at, and I'm going to honor God in my lane, because the moment I start taking control and switch lanes, that's when I take everybody off in the traffic behind me, and, and life stops, and there went my opportunity. Does that make sense? David stayed in his lane, and he did the best job he could possibly do, and he did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, when I'm weak, I'm stronger. Because I'm weak. I don't have any ability. I don't have any strength. I don't have anything that I can rely on on myself to get through this thing. I've got this thorn in the side that reminds me that I'm powerless. And my true power comes from Jesus alone. And that's where David was at. Both of these guys figured it out. And it sounds really bizarre because, can we admit it today? We like to be in control, don't we? Because it gives us safety. It gives us peace. It makes us feel like I can do something about this. I have a purpose in this, this tragic space that I'm in. And I have something that I can do to influence it and change it. When God's saying, no, 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 stay in your lane. Do the best you got right there. I'm in charge, remember? Okay, God, you're first. I'm second. Staying in my lane. Where is our strength in the waiting? Because really that's what we're talking about. We're talking about waiting. We're talking about that really ugly P word. Anybody know the P word? Nailed it. Patience. We don't like to talk about patience. We worry about praying for patience because then God's going to give us opportunities to be patient. And we don't want that. So we just avoid praying for patience, don't we? Patience isn't waiting really good. That's not the definition of patience. Sometimes we just think, well, if you be patient, you'll just learn to wait and you'll be okay with whatever happens. Patience isn't that. There's strength in waiting when it's not 
in our own hands, in God's hands. The thing that, got, that gave Paul strength was Jesus. The thing that, that gave David strength was his relationship with God. Neither of them took matters into their own hands. They stayed in their own lane. We try to fix things. We try to change lanes. We try to go back and forth. And it doesn't get any better. It may, may for a time, but then we're stuck again. God gives us those abilities to use. We have talents and resources, but who's directing you with these? So here's my posture. Here's what I've done, okay? Patience. Things get really challenging in my life. They're over my head. They're beyond what I can do. So I say, this is all I got. This is all I can do. I've done everything I know how to do, and this problem is still bigger than me. So God, it's yours. You said take my yoke upon you, carry the load. I'm the little one, you're the big one, let's work this together, but I can't carry this. This is, this is more than my shoulders can hold. This is, I, I don't have abilities for this situation, whatever it is. Your problem now. I'm going to step back. You said you would lead me. You said you would direct my life. You said you would give me strength. Here you go. And I just, I literally sometimes just go like that. Like, God, I'm done. I'm stepping back. This is all you. I'm, I'm hands off. But here's the thing. Being patient and waiting for God and allow him to, to take over and do things for you, it's not just and turning away. My posture is, and use this if you want. I'm just another Christian trying to follow Jesus the best I can. Nobody's, I'm up here to four steps, but I should be in the back row with you guys. Jesus, this is yours. I'm giving it to you. If there's anything I can do in the meantime, let me know what it is, and I'll wait for you to show me. But this baby's yours. I'm done with it. I'm turning it over to you. Let me know if you want me to be involved in any fashion or not. I'm here to help. I'm here to follow you, but this is yours. And I just give it over. And there's a peace in really difficult situations that I have that makes it easier to get through those. Because I'm not the one driving the bus. That's another movie. Ever watch Speed? I'm not the one. And so we stop changing lanes. We, I stick with the one I've got, and we do like David did. You, you do your absolute best in that space. And sometimes it feels like your best isn't enough. That's fine, because his is. You're not the one in charge. You're not the one in control. But when we try to take control, when we're changing the lanes, and we're going back and forth, and we're, we're trying to be the one, we're making everybody mad around us, get in an accident, and, and even worse, stay in your lane, do what you are able to do, and say, God, this is what I bring to the, to the situation. If you need me, I'm here, but this is, your, this is your baby right here. And that changes things. You find strength in that weakness. It does seem like bizarre things. David, you're the anointed king. Why are you playing guitar for this madman that's in your place? That's my lane. That's what I can do right now. That's what God has me doing. I'm going to do it the best. Right? We still sing his songs. He did it really well. It's really about patience. There's a lot of waiting involved in patience, but they aren't the same thing. Patience is not passive, meaning we just sit back and let things happen. No, no, no. Patience is active. David was patient for years. He endured assassination attempts. He put up with that madman of a boss, and his main job was to cheer that madman on. He was assigned other jobs, and he stayed in his lane, and he found success in those things he was given responsibility for. And when it was up to him, he did the absolute best he could, and he did a great job at it. Psalm chapter... Uh, chapter 40, Psalm 40. It's also a U2 song. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. David sang this one. Here's one of his songs. This is what he said. 
coming from the guy that did it, right? He had to wait. This is what he, he said. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on the rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth. Man, you ever feel like just singing a song when you're going through a hard time? No. <laughs> I'm not whistling on my way to work. I'm complaining, right? We've been there. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Wow, look what David did. This came from his own words, right? He's the one that endured it. David's reflection on his life, and he, it's what he did while he waited. Being patient involves doing the best you can with what you've got in the space that you have while you wait. You can wait a long time, and your time may never come. You may never overcome that thing that you so desperately want to overcome. You may have to completely reroute your travel plans because of the traffic that you're stuck in. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. You can wait a long time. That's what David did. Put on your boots. Make sure that you, got the, you do the most with what you've got and where you're at and let God handle the future. Stay in the present. Somebody needed to hear this today. Somebody needs to hear this. You've been changing lanes with your family. You've been changing lanes a bunch with your health. You've been changing lanes all over the place with your job. Maybe you've been changing your lanes with your walk with Jesus. Are you changing your lanes in your relationships? How about your finances? Changing lanes, changing lanes. I gotta take control. I gotta try this, gotta try that. How about your marriage? Changing your lanes. Maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. Are you changing lanes with your joy? Maybe this will make me happy for a long period of time. Maybe I can find contentment with this. It's time to be fully present where you're at and excel in the lane that you have for a while. Time to take the struggle and just give it to Jesus. Lay it at his feet and tell him, hey, my desire for something more, better, easier than this, is yours now. It's your baby. It's your problem. Let me know what I need to do in the meantime. For now, I'm going to honor you and do my best right now with where I'm at. We need that. Hey, let's pray. God, thanks for this challenge and this wake-up call this morning and allowing us to see that the battle's not ours, it's yours. And too often we try to fight that battle on our own, we try to take control, and we just can't win. And it gets hard. And we get tired. Sometimes it feels like we look in the mirror and we go, is this, is this what my life is going to amount to? I had so many more aspirations than this. I felt like you were going to have me do so much greater things, and yet I'm right here. My finances are a mess. My family's a mess. My job isn't fun. I come home every day tired. I got this health thing, I'm up all night for it. Is this what it means to follow you? And God, help us just to set that at your feet right now, this moment, right now. Say, I'm done. It's yours. Let me know what I can do in the meantime, but you're in charge of this now. Because I know that you have the power to do so. You are the God of the universe. You are the one who made all of creation. You are the one who made my body. You are the one who created those people in my life. You are the one who, who walked on water and rose from the dead and rose other people from the dead. God, you have, 
there's no end to what you can do. And so this, I fully trust you that you can handle this because I can't anymore. You've given me abilities. You've given me knowledge. You've given me experience. If you want me to use it, you show me what I should do. And I'll use that to the best of my ability. But in the meantime, this is your problem now. I trust you. We pray these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we've got a song. Somebody's going to lead it. I'm not. Listen to the words of this song. Do you meet them when you sing them? Is Jesus really yours? What does that mean if Jesus is yours? Let's sing that together. So Saul eventually became his own demise. He was losing a battle. He failed miserably. And uh, instead of being captured by the enemy, he decided to have his, his shield bearer help him, and he fell on his sword and killed himself. David then became king after a period of mourning, and David was disturbed by the passing of Saul. It's tough when the person that torments you all the time is finally gone. There's a lot of emotion in that. But David became king when he was about 30 years old. 2 Samuel 5, 4 tells us that. 
He waited 15 years for that promotion. He stayed in his lane for 15 years. Some of you would spend longer than that. And then he was king for 40 years. And he did really well at that too. Your time may never come. And it could. But for now, stay in your lane and do the best with whatever, whatever lot you've been given. And when Jesus comes back, May he find you faithful. Be blessed as you go today.